Welcome to Vienna. This is the 15th meeting of the European Multiple Myeloma Academy. And it is my pleasure to have with me today Dr. Brian Walker from the University of Arkansas in Little Rock in the United States, Dr. Irene Gabriel from the Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, United States again, and Professor Hervé Aveloiseau from the University Hospital in Toulouse in France. We have had this morning a very interesting discussion after your presentations about how myeloma evolve and what is the role of genetics and the role of microenvironment in the development in myeloma and whether or not this can help us not only to understand better the myeloma pathogenesis, but also to implement new therapeutic strategies and eventually to have the dream of cure. And then the first question that was raised is, which research area most likely will advance our understanding of myeloma initiation? Brian, what do you think? Uh, so for me, uh, that's definitely looking at the genetics um, of MGUS patients and samples. So understanding uh, both the genetics and epigenetics of what is going on in those cells will help us understand why those uh, cells arise in the first place. So looking at how the uh, IGH rearrangements occur, how the aneuploidy occurs in the hyperdiploid samples, uh, what epigenetic changes happen between a normal plasma cell and the MGUS plasma cell will also kind of uh, give us the information we need to know what is going wrong in these early stages. I mean. So I think it's definitely very complex and it, it, it requires maybe an effort from so many people. I think if we want to know what initiates myeloma, we have to look definitely at MGUS patients, but we also need to look at the microenvironment. And that doesn't only include the immune cells or the stromal cells that are surrounding, but also the germline cells. What is the event that led for susceptibility of those plasma cells to acquire mutations or uh, to acquire um, hyperdiploidy or to acquire translocations. And I think that requires an effort from so many of us to understand that. The other part is sequential samples that are from MGUS to smoldering to myeloma, because if we really want to understand progression, it has to be the same patient and what happened for them for clonal evolution. When you talk about microenvironment, you are not talking about the atmosphere, the petrol, the tobacco, I mean, uh, cigarettes, uh, similar to other diseases, uh, because I heard that there are some familial MGAS or familial uh, multiple myeloma. Is any uh, inheritance in that or is so definitely what predisposes us to develop myeloma, there is so much work to be done. Familial myeloma or familial cases have been uh, discussed and there are many cases. Indeed, actually some of the work from Gareth Morgan has shown uh, that uh, we can look at some of those patients and what are the susceptibility um, genetic changes that occur in those patients. I think we need to do more for that. We know that African-American population, for example, is three times more common to have myeloma, yet we don't know why is that. Uh, so so we haven't even looked at those racial disparities and what are the changes that occur in those patients to make them susceptible to myeloma. So I think the next steps will require a lot of germline understanding also. But uh, Hervé, if a patient has multiple myeloma, he should be worried about the potential myeloma in his son? Yeah, it was my comment after Irene uh, talked because uh, we have to be very careful for that myeloma is not a genetic disease. It is not like some uh, colon cancer or some breast cancer. We don't have, we have very, very few families with uh, a familial history. So uh, we, we have to say that we don't know what is the risk factors to develop myeloma. And so for me, the two areas of research is, of course, as Brian said, uh, genetics, because uh, nowadays we are able to sequence every patient, and so we will definitely find something. And the second area is probably immunology. It has been totally ignored for uh, years and years, and now we have tools to try to modify uh, the immune cells, and I think so definitely it will be 
maybe not the most important, but one of the important areas in the future. Okay. Regarding genetics, genetics is critical in all the cancer, uh, particularly in myeloma, re really relevant. Until the 80s, cytogenetics was the only available techniques. Then, FIS analysis has become the standard of care and is currently the standard of care for identification of high-risk patients. Also, gene expression profile has done a good contribution, but what comes next? Uh, so I think for diagnostics, we need to move towards uh, next generation sequencing panels. Uh, so a lot of the information that can be gained from FISH can also be gained from these panels so that you can detect the translocations and copy number changes. But the sequencing also gives you the advantage that you can also get mutations as well. So you can find out uh, if a patient has a deletion of 17P and whether or not they have a mutation as well. So moving this into the diagnostic field uh, is going to be really important, but will also be a challenge as well. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think next generation sequencing is becoming cheaper and more available now. There are so many panels that are available already uh, that insurances uh, are paying for. Uh, in the States at least. I know in Europe it's a little bit different. But as we understand better the disease, we need to understand the biology and that's by next generation sequencing. Is the same perception in Europe? Yeah, uh, because here we, are, we have experts uh, coming from very, very specific uh, cancer centers. I'm not sure that uh, in all US it is available for all the patients if they are not in uh, very high level uh, centers. In Europe, it is not yet here because it is still expensive. We need to have bioinformatics, which is not developed yet. But I definitely agree that uh, for the future, maybe in the five coming years, it, we have to, to move to uh, uh, sequencing with uh, targeted panels. If I understand correctly, the next generation sequencing will give you information about the mutational situation of many of the genes, which is, could be very relevant because they can become targets for th therapeutics. How far are we from PE? Uh, so I think in myeloma we're still quite far away from that. So there are some targets uh, for which there are drugs available, such as BRAF, uh, but the experience with those has been a little bit mixed, I think people have seen. Um, there are also um, targets such as super enhancers. So super enhancers are really important for uh, overexpression of the oncogenes associated with translocations, especially MYC. Uh, again, bromo domain inhibitors have been tried out in myeloma in that. But again, it's been a little bit hit and miss. Um, I think you know, we need to go ahead with finding what these targets should be and uh, hope that the uh, drug companies and the chemists can catch up and uh, make the drugs that will make the difference to the patients. What is your opinion about clinical management based on mutational analysis? Yeah, so I think the, the naysayers usually say, well, KRAS, NRAS and MYC are not targetable and therefore why are we looking at the mutations? I think we have to think a little bit beyond that and start thinking, well, first thing, maybe we can look at pathways. KRAS, NRAS and others will activate the MAP kinase pathway and you can develop potentially better drugs of MAP kinase inhibitors. We can also start looking at even just the 1114 translocation data with venetoclax. That's the first evidence that a drug could potentially work on a specific subset of patients. So trying to use the prognostic data and trying to use the biology and then therapy can come after is very important. And yes, we don't have MYC inhibitors now. Bromo domains may be okay, but they're not perfect. But there are so many drugs that are being developed and we should hope that we get the information and the biology and then the therapy will come after. Did you agree? Yeah, I do agree, even if uh, I am not a big fan of uh, these uh, targeted therapies because it has been used uh, by many of our uh, solid tumors colleagues. And when you are inhibiting the specific uh, pathway, you do see some response, but soon after you see another pathway which is uh, activated. So, so far in myeloma, we have broad uh, treatment, proteasome inhibitors, uh, monoclonal antibody, imids, bone marrow transplant, which I think is still the basis of treatment. Yeah. And particularly, I, th I think if we consider the genetic complexity in multiple myeloma, it's not a, a single genetic abnormality which drives multiple myeloma, unfortunately. Uh, probably we, I mean, this uh, specific 
therapies will contribute probably, yes. but not as a single agent. This yeah. is my view. Yeah. One is not against the other. I think yeah. in general, we, I don't think any single drug alone is yeah. effective in a cancer because it's such a complex system. So putting the right drugs together Except in combination. Except CML, which is very specific. Uh, with yeah. a very specific uh, APL, target, of the course. Other one. Yeah. 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 But the, these are, yeah. the, yeah, these okay. are not the common ones. <laughs> We have progressed uh, starting from the initiation of therapy, the, the good diagnosis, what is going to be for the future. But everybody in myeloma has a dream to cure myeloma. If you are a patient, to listen that myeloma will become curable at some stage. What do you think should be the steps just to, to achieve this dream? Uh, I think it goes back to what Irene says, it's, uh, it's important to understand the biology behind what's going on in these cells. Uh, and if we can understand the pathways that are being affected, uh, the environment that the cells are living in as well, then we can better treat the patients uh, and hopefully get a cure. I think, and taking again from the example of CML, if you had used Gleevec in a uh, blast crisis of CML or in the late stages, Gleevec would have been useless. Treating patients early before disease progresses is probably the right way for us to cure myeloma. And I think if we look at the early stages of smoldering, potentially even in certain areas where we can cure patients with myeloma, it would be before we have end organ damage. The idea of waiting until they have all of this damage with clonal evolution, with immune uh, escape or happening and then hoping for the best is like treating with a static disease and it doesn't make sense. Yes, uh, I think we are not so far from cure. I think, uh, and I'm not sure that biology will uh, be uh, very critical to, to, to do that. Nowadays we have very good drugs and for example the uh, uh, availability of daratumumab in the past years show that we have a very, very good response. So I do believe that a combination of a proteasome inhibitor, uh, daratumumab, uh, an imid uh, with a long-term maybe bone marrow transplant, I've, and it, it has been shown by uh, the Arkansas group uh, before without these drugs that they have a CR weight for a very, very long time in many of the patients. So I don't think we have so far from uh, the, the cure of myeloma, of course not for all the patients, but I think for a significant number of them. You have put the finger in a very interesting uh, point, and is sometimes biology comes first, sometimes the clinic is first. And I think we have two beautiful examples in hematology. One is CML. 922 translocation was described. Everybody was focusing, we identified clearly the target, several labs, several pharmaceutical companies start, started to work to identify the best drug for this target. The opposite was with acute promyelocytic leukemia. They identified that ATRA, transretinoic acid, was working very well in these patients and they tried to understand why does it work and they found the PML rare in the translocation. Uh, sometimes the knowledge start from the bench, mm -hmm. sometimes the knowledge start from the bedside, yeah. but what is critical is to go together yeah. the bench and the bedside. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much to all of you for this interesting conversation, and I hope we will, have, we will help our colleagues and the patients, that is, at the end of the day, our duty. Thank you very much.